first ever press briefing following the rate decision, and that could be a big event risk. And despite an eventful quarter, U.S. stocks closed out the first three months on, a po on, on the year on a positive note. What are some of the big investment themes to look out for in the fresh quarter that's just begun? Log on to our website on cbc.com to find out. Finally, Friday morning here on Squawk Asia. Japan's unfolding nuclear nightmare has forced many governments around the world to review their nuclear energy and safety programs. Public opinion appears to be turning against using nuclear plants to power their uh, homes as well as cities. But with China and India's energy hungry economies uh, and booming populations demanding more fuel, can the world really afford to turn its back on nuclear power, which many analysts say is a cleaner, cheaper and better source of energy. For more, let's talk to Tom James. He is co-founder also chairman of Navitas Resources, a natural resources consultancy. And across in San Francisco, we've got uh, David Needle, uh, Riedel, uh, president and founder of uh, Riedel Research Group uh, from the Bay Area. Gents, good to see the both of you. And thank you for your time. Uh, David, let me start with you uh, in San Francisco uh, first. I mean, you know, we had Three Mile Island, we had Chernobyl, then we had what amounted to, I guess, a, a nuclear freeze for a good quarter of a century or so. And just recently, within the last couple of years, a uh, renaissance of, of interest in nuclear, and then this Japan disaster happened. So, uh, you know, it, how long is nuclear going to be put on the back burner for, do you think? I'm afraid it's going to be for quite some time. I think it's, it's still unfolding in Japan, but I think it's set into people's minds that this is a, a dangerous thing, this is somehow unhealthy or, or bad for the environment and so on and so forth. So uh, I'm afraid that this is going to have the same effect that Three Mile Island had in 79 and Chernobyl had in 86, which is to freeze, delay, stop, and cancel quite a lot of the new build that was being proposed in China, in India, in Brazil, in Russia, and elsewhere around the world. Mm, Tom, do you agree with that? I mean, uh, certainly it's not so much a cost issue as it, as it is a uh, political uh, issue. It's going to be really hard for uh, governments to get their people behind uh, this sort of idea, with the exception of maybe an emerging market, uh, Asia, China, India, we've got Indonesia, we've got Thailand, Vietnam, considering a nuclear as well. These are places where it would probably be easier for governments to get this idea off the ground, no? Well, it's a matter, of, again, of power, demand and development. Uh, if we look over the next 20 years, we're expecting to see another 3 billion people connected to the power grid uh, across Asia, Africa and South America. Um, and where's that energy going to come from? Um, uh, oil and gas obviously has pollution issues. And, and um, as Riedel mentioned, I mean, the, the fact is, this is the only, to put it into perspective, this is only the third major incident in 65 years of civilian nuclear energy. Oh, hold on. Only the third? I mean, it only takes one sometimes, you know? Okay, well, you know, <laughs> thousands of people uh, lose their lives every year in mining and accidents and oil rig accidents and stuff like that. So, yes, um, I, think, I think the real fallout here is that uh, the old nuclear designs, you know, the ones like in Japan, you know, they're 30, 40 years old, they're very basic, uh, they're not as, they're inherently not as safe, they, they, they weren't yeah. even using materials, uh, modern materials and containment technology, mm -hmm. which is out there these days. So yeah. I think the biggest fallout, like we've seen in Germany, is a, a, a massive review of can we keep extending the old nuclear reactors? Mm -hmm. If there is anything positive to be taken away from this disaster in Fukushima Daiichi, it is that the industry is looking within internally and should improve safety standards. How stringent do you think they're going to become? Is there going to be a cost burden on the industry as well? I, th I mean, the nuclear with? industry is very, very safe um, in terms of its, its track record. I think the key thing here is you know, realistically saying, uh, and politicians and uh, planners have had to put things on hold because of the whole debate of, you know, nuclear energy and radiation and stuff like that, after Chernobyl especially. Mm. Uh, I think, in fact, if it hadn't been for Chernobyl, perhaps we had already have replaced some of these older nuclear reactors with the more modern, much safer mm. ones. Um, so I think the review really is, okay, we need to actually uh, look at the very old reactors. There's 442 reactors in the world, of which 360 of them are more than 20 years old. Okay. So this is the older technology. 
um, and those need to be replaced with right. the safer ones. All right, David, that includes, of course, reactors in the U.S., most of them still first uh, generation, but the president is uh, grappling with the idea of, and we were talking with the Tom about this, thorium reactors, much more abundant than uh, uranium-1 and a lot safer as well. Do you think that's going to be really hard to, uh, to get off the ground? I think it is, and I think that the reality is that the citizens are not going to take the time to learn that the technology has gotten better or containment vessels can be built better or so on and so forth. They're going to hear nuclear and they're going to say no. Even in China, which is, has shown an ability to put through any kind of project, including the Three Gorges Dam, um, has pulled back on their plans because of concerns among their citizens uh, about the health effects of this. So I'm afraid it's going to take uh, more than, than a change in the technology uh, to convince citizens that it's now okay. safe. All right, tell you what, let's leave the politics and uh, the people aside for now and focus on the technology. I don't mean to get uh, too geeky here, but, you know, we were talking about thorium. Tom and I were talking about uh, fourth-generation technology, pebble bed reactors or graphite reactors, as they're known. They rely on these graphite balls about the, the size of tennis balls or so. I mean, in contrast, let's say the first-generation reactors in, in Fukushima and uh, in, in Japan, they do not rely on water for cooling. They do not rely on power for cooling, it sounds like the holy grail for nuclear power. David? It, it sounds like it, but I, I, I'm afraid the citizens aren't going to uh, come along with you on that educational process of explaining to them why that's so different. If you can convince them over the next 10 or 20 years that this is not nuclear, it's not going to melt down, it's not going to have the impact, maybe they'll listen. But in the near term, I don't think they want to hear the word nuclear having anything mm. to do with adding to the energy grid at this point. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't want to sound as if like I'm sitting here uh, trying to promote nuclear energy and it's all warm and fuzzy and there's no risk. That I'm a realist. I mean, I look at uh, across all energy markets. In fact, I just finished off a big study in renewable energies for the Middle East. And they've got all the oil, but they have a, an issue of uh, generating electricity for water. Big power problems. You know, the reality is is that if uh, if we don't have nuclear as part of the energy mix. What's the alternative? Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the alternatives, because you've made the point, uh, Tom, that there's renewed interest for biofuels and biomass. But again, there are some inherent tensions there, as we realized quite starkly back in 2008, because corn is the major ingredient there. Makes it more expensive for people to eat. Exactly, and yeah. we're seeing that yes, happen yes. again right now with the U.S. farmers. You saw this in the USDA report, putting aside more acreage for corn because yeah. the biofuel is becoming more attractive. Isn't there a real tension there? Yeah, I mean, corn in the first quarter that we just, uh, we just blew through, up 10%? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think certainly the biofuels and uh, side of things will help us a lot uh, decrease or even uh, halt the increase in, in oil consumption just for transportation. We've seen the first uh, uh, algae-based uh, biojet fuels been ticked in the box uh, by the Department of Defense in the U.S., and that's now also going to Australia. Uh, Qantas is pushing that as well. So it's still, uh, it's still early days, but uh, that's coming in there. Um, but in for biomass biofuels, at least in Africa, in India and parts of China, uh, non-food crops uh, yeah. can help us a little bit on the way. But yeah. it's, it's just buying us time, yeah. really, at the moment. Okay, listen, David, I mean, before we even have to think about putting sort of algae-based stuff in our, in our cars, in our gas tanks, etc., you think there's probably a simpler, uh, much more uh, obvious solution, or alternative, that would be cleaner coal, I assume you mean, as well as natural gas. Well, I'm not necessarily arguing for, for that you're going to see cleaner coal. I just think you're going to see more consumption of coal. I mean, China's generation is dominated right now by coal, and I think they're going to buy more of the stuff because they've got the infrastructure for it and they've got the, the markets to, to buy it from. So I think you're going to see coal and natural gas. I think biomass and biofuels are a nice idea on the margin, but you only have one example globally of a non-fuel crop developing a good transportation fuel, and that's in Brazil with sugarcane ethanol. And there's been a lot of things that have been tried, and a lot of things have, have not succeeded. So I'm, I think the reality is that people are going to be burning more coal and buying mm -hmm. and burning more natural gas to run that power. I think the, okay. the other thing that we're missing here, I mean, why do people build nuclear power stations beside Tokyo? 
you know, I mean, you know, if, if, you know, if there are inherent risks there. The point is, is the concentration of demand of power. We have renewable alternatives. I mean, even China, as David mentioned, has put things on hold uh, for some of their nuclear plans. Uh, and in fact, has a huge percentage already of wind farm, like 120 gigawatts, you know, yeah, plans. Yeah, there's a wind, right? Yes. Good, yeah. But uh, the point is, is that um, that's only useful if the wind is steady. And also, um, how do you get that power effectively and efficiently to where it's needed? Mm. And in China, we're already seeing these uh, big social movements, people moving from the countryside, mm. the cities are getting bigger. Yeah. And that's where nuclear power stations <clears throat> can replace hundreds of coal fire power mm. stations and give power next to the big metropolises that are building up. Very interesting stuff. Okay, uh, guys, listen, we got to go. Uh, great to talk to both of you. Tom James from Navitas Resources around the desk with us at the SGX, and uh, David Riedel from Riedel Research Group over in the Bay Area. We're going to do a morning call up uh, next on Squawk Asia. We'll get you set up for the train day ahead at Greater China Wise. Uh, when we come back, as we head into the break, though, take a look back at the events that shaped the tail end of the quarter that uh, just was, Q1 the month of March. And this is where it all began on Friday. The earthquake struck right. I'm convinced that all of Japan will recover from this. There is no question that Libya and the world would be better off with Gaddafi out of power. Energy call. Let's take a closer look at the oil market. China focus. Let's take a look at the market reaction. Uh, we're still in negative territory. The call to action. What's your top trade? Get the lowdown. What you need to be doing with your money. With Joe and Bernie Lowe. Welcome everybody to our new show, The Call. The Call. Weekdays at 9 a.m. Only on CNBC. Welcome back to Squawk Box. Happy Friday, everyone. I'm Tling Shanghai. 38 minutes to go till the start of trading in the Chinese market. We're expecting a quiet session today. Uh, the Shanghai Composite has been down for the past three th sessions, and we're not seeing a rebound today because being Friday, there's the usual case of policy jitters. Also, this is coming just before a four-day weekend for Qingming Festival, uh, so uh, that will keep things very cautious. We are on Data Watch. March PMI numbers or official PMI numbers are out in a number of minutes. We're expecting a rebound for the reading after three months of fall. 
falls. In fact, the uh, HSBC PMI already shows an uptick to 52.5. So that is good for those who are worried about slowing growth, but it adds to inflation fears, especially seeing as institutions such as Bank of Communications are forecasting March CPI in China to exceed 5%. We've got Xinyin Wanguo seeing a 5.3% rating, which would be even above last year's high of 5.1% uh, because of the spike in food prices. And analysts say after two triple R hikes in the past two months, it may be time for a rate hike. Uh, stocks to watch. Uh, we've got the last trickle of earnings and a big name to watch today is China Merchants Bank, the number six bank in China. 2010 net profit rose 41% to 25.8 billion yuan, thanks to a wider net interest margin of 2.65%, which is higher than the big four state banks. Its fees income also surged 42%, while bad debt provisions climbed to a high of 320%. The only thing not to like, perhaps, is the fact that uh, fourth quarter earnings were flat. Now it's over to Emily. Good morning. Hi, good morning, Lei. Happy Friday to you. And the Taiwan market also trading up against a long four-day uh, weekend. We've got the Children's Day and then also the Qingming Festival, uh, Monday and Tuesday, respectively. Uh, as far as the TIEX is concerned, for the first quarter of this year, it was a pullback of 3.2%. And today, we are going to be watching shares of Acer. In the last four sessions alone, the stock has pulled back 18% after the company gave some guidance about its sales for the first quarter and second quarter. Now, get this. The CEO, Gianfranco Lan he has now resigned uh, from his post and the company's chairman, this is J.T. Wong, uh, stepping in as the CEO effective from today. Now the management change comes after Acer uh, revises its Q1 earnings forecast downwards. Over This is over concerns about sluggish demand for notebook PCs. Now uh, they want to reorganize their operations to tackle the rising challenge from the iPad tablet. Of course that is Apple. Now Lanchi resigned because he held different views from the majority of Acer's board members. He joined Acer back in 1997, has been CEO since 2004, and he has taken Acer from the number four place in the world in terms of global market share. They acquired Gateway, that pushed them to a uh, number three, and then now the Acer is a uh, PC maker number two in the world. So we are going to be watching shares of Acer today starting at $60, and that's Taiwan per piece. Uh, we are expecting some negative pressure because we do expect uh, there to be some short term impact from his departure. Martin. Back to you now. All right. Thanks a lot. Ems, uh, Emily Chandler up in Hong Kong. That'll do it for this Friday edition of Squawk Asia. The call is coming up next on CNBC with the, the opening numbers for the Singapore, Malaysia, and Taiwan markets. Do not go away. Central banks are flooding the world with cheap money. Interactive brokers will lend 1 million U.S. dollars at just 1.3% for every 200,000 in a portfolio margin account. See our high dividend scanner for the many hundreds of stocks that yield over 5%. Interactive brokers, stocks, options, futures, forex, bonds, worldwide from one account. Thank you. long drop down there, in fact, half a kilometer to be exact. This week on Straight Talk, we take you to the very top of what is the world's newest and tallest hotel. The Ritz-Carlton re-emerges in Hong Kong after a long three years, but with the Japan nuclear situation, high oil prices, the mini situation, is it time to open a new hotel? We'll talk to the chief of the parent, Mera International, on the show. Straight Talk with Bernie Lowe, today at 5 on CNBC. The only show dedicated to the $4 trillion international currency market. Make money in money. Get in the game. Saturday at 5.30 a.m. Money in motion. Currency trading. Only on CNBC. This weekend on CNBC Live. The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Please welcome the always entertaining Howie Mandel. My brother's interested in astronomy and, and space. And so I saw this book. This is the a real book. I got him. I swear I didn't make this. This is not a prop. You know, there's... See? Look.
Let's explore Uranus. Yeah. You know, and and <laughs> I know nothing yeah. about Uranus. Look at this. It's got it says it has a gassy atmosphere. Right, right. But tonight's show with guest Howie Mandel. Sunday at 12 a.m.